is what I would call like a polyculture. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of a, a food forest meadow idea. Now keep in mind, you guys are coming in at the kind of, the, you see how everything's sort of peaking? So this sunflower, the main sunflower is already being picked apart by the birds. And it's the time of year, August, what, 18th was the, the date today? Mm, yeah. Something like that. 18, right? 18. So we're kind of cresting over the, the peak of summer as right. we're starting to settle down. And so I try to leave as much as possible growing and then throughout the fall, I'll come in and continue chopping and dropping. Right. And you can see I've already chopped some sunflowers that have come down and pulled certain things out, trying to emphasize the last of the peppers. We had that big, uh, I don't know if well, you guys obviously remember, but we had the derecho, the big windstorm that came. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And I came right after the storm. Oof. And this plum tree was starting to lean, get the wind, like yeah. trying to pull up. So I actually took off like a pretty big chunk of the canopy uh, to protect it from actually uprooting the plant. So right. It'll bounce back fine. And uh, yeah, there's a mixture of, you know, perennial flower species, a lot of natives, uh, some from around the world as well. Um, and so polyculture, where you have like the main keystone species, in this case, this sort of abused plum. And then down beneath, you got bergamot. Uh, there's gray-headed coneflower down there. There's uh, uh, currants. There's garlic chives. You know, over here, you have another red currant. You have an apple tree, which is the keystone with some asparagus coming up through. Um, these are some beds I'm actually flipping. So they had a variety of annual crops and I put garlic. You can start to see it prick up through the, the leaf and the organic matter. Uh, so garlic's coming back up with walking onions. I had a nice big trellis full of tomatoes, but that blew over in the storm. And, the, and I don't really want to like take it apart yet. All right, is this sun gold over here? It could be. I don't actually remember what variety it was. There's also the uh, black crim, I think. Ooh. Yeah, so this is hazelnut wood. It was a really good trellis, but the you know, the wind. Right, you know, right. Apart. So, but yeah, help yourself to any fruits you see. But I've been trying to make some biochar. So actually, that's how I'm setting up here. And you can see I've mixed in uh, some relatively big chunks of biochar. And then the high vee near here actually has, the, I think it's the Starbucks giving away coffee grounds. So. Coffee grounds. That's why I smell the coffee yeah, grounds. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> Just trying to keep organic matter. Like right. basically no-till and then trying to cover the soil as much as possible. No-till, no-dig method? Yeah, actually you guys should try some of these like little Texas currant tomatoes. They're super good. Ooh. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're really sweet. Oh, you, can get, you can go inside if you want to, if you're brave enough to brave, brave oh. the corn cage. You get some. Uh, these are ones I actually grew from seed from last year. Now the idea behind this is the raccoons are quite fierce here. Right. Uh, there's tiny, tiny little tomatoes, and they're super sweet. Um, here's a good one here. Uh, I was trying to grow corn in here because the raccoons have eaten in the past. Um, and it worked okay, but then I got corn smut, and I think some sort of bowl <laughs> got in and ate the corn anyway. So the corn didn't work well. But in addition, you know, function stacking. This is an Apios Americana, so a ground nut. Uh, it's a North American tuberous crop. So that's, and then there's also some Chinese yam growing over there. Ooh. Um, yeah, this is the first year I'm trying to grow it, so I'm kind of excited. Uh, I think it should be growing. How's it? I think this is the, the Chinese yam here. So hopefully that comes back pretty well. It's a little bit crazy in here, but then there's some like underground peas. Sort of a three sisters concept that's kind of gotten right. pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it, did, it kept the raccoons out, but overall not a perfect success. <laughs> but you know, you try things and yep. now I'm interested more of uh, hazelnuts in here. And then the peach tree was beautiful. I can share a couple pictures with you if you want. Oh, sure. Um, had a ton of peaches on it. The raccoons did come in and really just took a number on it. So Oof. you can see branches that broke off. And uh, so yeah, it's kind of, this is the most like crazy time of year in the garden. Right. Um, but you can see once again, polyculture with, there were sunflowers growing, there's asparagus. There's actually a service berry and a honeyberry, uh, which is kind of a bold concept. And then this peach tree, now it's really looking abused. See, there's a couple major branches that broke off. Some branches up top that got bent over, some more broken up inside the canopy. Uh, but it grew about 200 peaches this year, um, of which I probably got to harvest about 40 or 50. <laughs> oh, raccoons that's a all. shame. Yeah, but you know, it's the way it goes. You look around, there's an apricot tree, another apple tree, a big pear tree, a couple grafted pears and apricots, and there's a cherry tree that's really abused by the Japanese beetles. Oh. But still growing pretty good. Yep. It happens every year. And then underneath, there's some honeyberries, uh, a couple different kinds of these in the garden, um, which grow really, really well here. I would actually recommend hmm. if you're interested in polyculture and, and perennials, right. honeyberries over blueberries here. Okay. Because um, blueberries don't grow very well. Yeah, if you want a zucchini. <laughs> 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 yeah. the, the golden flowers are black-eyed Susans, which are nice this time of year. And then uh, here's another peach tree that'll be coming up. So maybe we're placing that. 
rhubarb and another apricot, another apple tree that I grafted. Um, it's kind of a this junky area. <laughs> Everything's in a sort of not put back together. This part right. will kind of clean up and. All right. But yeah, and then this is probably the biggest honeyberry in the garden. Uh, the berries are a lot like the blueberry, but a different species. Um, from sort of like Russia, Korea, Japan area, uh, depending on which genetics you're getting from. Yeah, do you have any questions on the garden? Or? Um, well, I think the main thing that you did this was to, in, you know, trying to, um, you know, attract the bees and like all oh, the sure. useful insects so that it yeah. repels, you know, other insects, right? So you don't have to use like repellent and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, so I've actually seen the rusty patch bumblebee here. Ooh. Um, not this year, a couple years ago. And unfortunately, they bulldozed a big section of forest over there. So I'm right. hoping that there's still pretty good diversity. But yeah, there's definitely a huge variety of bumblebees, huge variety of lace wings and, and uh, wasps. I've seen the blue steel cricket killer wasp, tons of butterflies. And actually, in that vein, I have a section specifically in the garden for, uh, it's sort of like what I call the prairie. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to walk over here. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of insect diversity, and that's actually one of the things I like the most about the garden. But this, so this is a uh, willow tree that I actually propagated from like near Ledges State Park. Just, uh, you know, late winter, take a cutting, stick in the ground. Right. And there's a ton of uh, caterpillar species that use this as its, their, their fodder Ah, product. interesting. So this is pretty cool. I, one, I saw a, a white admo, I think is the butterfly species. And then later in the summer, I saw it come back as an adult, or at least the same species, which uh. is really cool. And then you have like cup pant, this is the Helianthus family. Really the Spring, water plants for the foreign. Uh, so I have some flowers that are still coming on like the... I try to keep flowers. What do you call it? The Mexican the sunflowers still coming in. Throughout, like, the... And then my uh, Jerusalem artichokes will flower right up through frost. That'll be going until everything's frozen. Um, so yeah, it definitely is um, a diverse polycultural system with a pretty heavy insect component, which doesn't mean zero damage. Right. So there's different species that grow well here and there's some that don't. For example, like kale grows really well, but we definitely have the cabbage white moth. And so during the height of the summer, you'll see, well, this one doesn't happen, but you can see some damage presumably right. from mm -hmm. the, cabbage, the cabbage moth. Yeah. It doesn't bother me though, because I always tell people like, well, this means there's no poison on it, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then as the, as the season progresses, it actually keeps growing fine. And then the later yeah. foliage is real pretty. Mm. Uh, eggplant doesn't grow well here because I haven't found a way to grow it without using chemicals to keep the flea beetles off. Oh, um, I okay. think you could use netting, but I've just never, I also no. don't really like eggplant, so I just don't grow okay. it. Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, you, you plant what you eat, you know? Exactly, so. right? So it's like, well, I'm not gonna baby this plant that I only Right, like right, right. Like. Tomatoes, I mean, you'll eventually see some, well, it's been a pretty dry year, so it hasn't been bad, but you can see some of the, you know, wilting that happens later in the season, like some down here. Oh, and, you know, I, through yeah. pruning, trying to keep the foliage up off the ground, right. that'll help. Right. In the, actually, we have grapes right now, which is exciting for you guys. Uh, so there's probably nine kinds of grapes around the exterior of the garden using the fencing as a trellis. Mm -hmm. um, well, and here's another one. So here's a North American crop. I don't know how you like bitter. <laughs> it's, it's called Neronia berry. Um, they're, they're quite good. It's an acquired taste. Some people make sugar with it because it does have sort of a bitter taste, which people don't really eat in American cuisine. Right. Um, I don't mind it, but it has a slight bitter component to it too. Um, heavily medicinal, I guess, but the grapes, are just starting to get ready, which is exciting. And this is the first year, uh, they are seeded by the way, so expect a seed, um, but they're quite good. And they're, in previous years, I lost most of them to black rot, oh. but it's been a pretty dry year. So right. no fungicide. You can see the leaves are heavily damaged by black or by Japanese beetles, but mm. the grapes, I mean, they're pretty prolific. You can see a ton of bunches. Yep. And this is with all the birds, all the chipmunks, all the squirrels, all yep. the raccoons, and they eat a fair amount, but you know, if you have enough abundance logic, try to grow, try to outgrow the, right, right. the animals. And also being humble, I don't draw my livelihood from this. Hmm. So I'm able to lose a lot of them and still be happy, you know? Oh, right, exactly. Um, yeah, that's exciting. This is the first real year with a good a grape crop. And there's some purple ones coming in over there. Ooh. So what do you do with the, the grapes? You just eat them fresh or you like wine or like jam or? I've, I've been getting more into fermentation. So mm. I've, I've tried what I guess you call a mellow mel, where you had, uh, like a mead is a honey wine. Right. A mellow mel would be basically mead with fruit. So mm. you're, you're mixing the sugar source. Right. But the so honey berries are good to these. ferment because they have a nice bitter table grapes. Sort of like what you saw. Uh, but then again, that's right. just, you right. know, you that fixation. I think it brings me anything. The flavor. Right. Um, but yeah, hopefully in the future there'll be, well, there's different things ready at different times of year. And so earlier in the season, we had tons of strawberries, tons of honey berries, tons of currants, 
uh, red currants, Ooh. various kinds of black currants, pink currants, some white currants, mm. um, blackberries. We, there's sea berries way over there. Kind of hard to get to at the moment because the sunflowers right, are taking right. over. Um, but there's sea berries. There's black raspberries. There's red raspberries. Mm. The aronia berries. There's service berries that made some berries. A lot of berries. Basically, as right. many things as you can as you can get. Um, the one thing this garden, or one thing this garden lacks, is more of a nut overstory, which you know it's only forty by forty feet. Right. So there's only so much you can do. Yeah. But I do. I have been growing chestnuts. So there's some Chinese chestnuts in a little container over there. Ooh, very um, interesting. And some American Chinese hybrids, mm. which are kind of cool. So I might put some more than around the garden, right. as opposed to just inside of the garden. Right. Are you planning to do anything um, late in October? Because I know some people still doing some, you know. The main thing I'm trying to do now is add biochar, kind of get the garden set up for next year. Right. And because it's so crazy, uh, you know, or it's so dense in polyculture, a lot of things are delayed. And so you'll get a staggered crop even without successfully planting. Gotcha. And I don't think it's a better strategy. That's just kind of the strategy that works for me. Right. Um, so like kales and stuff will be, I mean, they'll be able to be harvested through the first snows um, until it gets really cold and then it, everything will be frozen. Right, right. Um, but there's like carrots that I'll still keep pulling up. Some of the daikon radishes are self-seeding, so you'll, those will come up. This, uh, it looks kind of weedy, but in some ways I've designed the weeds I like. Part, so yeah. this is a lamb's uh, quarters, which in the springtime is really tasty. So um, at this time of year, it's a little bit not like to, so fibrous here's a, an annual bed but for the most part. I'm now putting in more perennial elements, but I want to leave some annual space for various vegetables. Right. So like sweet potato, I will dig up. Um, there's a pepper that I'll just cut off at the ground. The kale I'll cut off at the ground. For the most part, I use a hand scythe. Mm. Um, so, it's also good for making biochar. But this is a good tool for cutting along the surface of the ground. Right. Especially if I sharpened it. It's a little mm -hmm. bit dull at the moment. Oh, yep. <laughs> flipping around. Sandals, good OSHA approved uh, footwear. But yeah, so in the fall, I might come in and you know, just try to chop at the ground and just lay on the ground. Get everything up there. Yeah. yeah. We're necessary. Like, I'm not afraid to dig up there. That's fine, like where the sweet potatoes are. Mm -hmm. um, there's walking onions that'll come back next year here. As you can see, I'm trying to add biochar into the soil, which is what this charcoal is here. And as opposed to like, you could sort of till it into the soil, mm -hmm. but I figure if you leave it on the surface, I'm gonna crush it up a little bit, but the earthworms will come right. and eat it and then I'll put, like more leaves on top and next year I'll probably put a layer of compost on top again and so you can see over time it's developed a pretty good rich loamy texture to it with a lot of organic matter and it's quite different than what the soil was when I first got here and it probably there's still probably layers because yeah so you can see I have added a little bit of uh you know till a little bit of sand to the soil as well but pretty nice soil here I would recommend you like look around because originally, well, Iowa historically has really good soil. So this would be part of Iowa that had the glaciers come in around 10,000, 12,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when that melted, it left all the, the deposits of the mm. soil. And so historically, we would have topsoil, I don't know, 10, 20 feet deep. That's you know, crazy. Rich black yeah. soil. But this is not that. Right. So this, I'm assuming at one point, was bulldozed off. And then they brought in some more topsoil. Right. So there's about a foot of topsoil when I got here. Oh. It's still pretty good for like most of the world, but yeah. not that good for Iowa. No. You know? And beneath that, there's hard packed clay. Mm. And so what I've been doing is trying to build up the beds in relatively permanent ways um, over time. And this is only five years, so it gets better and better year better on better. year. You know, With you more established, this, this, or you know, twenty years, yep, it's, it's so built up. I think yeah, this is the first be year that I had a really good crop of peaches. Um, I've had a few plums off the plum tree behind you. But for the most part, the fruit trees really haven't made that much fruit yet. Right. Now, fortunately, berries do make fruit a lot faster. So this current bush to your left, it's, you know, on its way out because of the season. Right. But like this made a ton. It made a couple big gallon bags full of currants. Oh, wow. You know, so that's pretty fun. And then the asparagus, I haven't eaten too much of it, but it's, you know, coming in well. And I put it in various spots of the garden. I'm not sure this is the best spot to grow asparagus, you know, inside under a tree. But, you know, it's yeah. kind of fun <laughs> and it grows well. And then... These, uh, so I was living at a place that had good hazelnut wood. This is not a particularly good example of hazelnut trellis given that it's fallen over, but mm -hmm. the wood itself is still very strong. It's just, right. it just was too much wind that got pulled out of the ground. Right. Um, and so this, these hazelnuts both make a good nut crop, but also can provide the trellis wood for future gardens. Um, 
Yeah. So I forget the original question, but that's <laughs> like, eat, a, eat a fair amount. There's a lot of good diversity, a lot of life. And part of that's just that we're, we're surrounded by a forest. So that increases the animals that'll eat your food, but also the variety of animals you'll see. Like mm. I've seen weasels here, which is kind of fun. There's a whole host of birds that fly through because the creek is close by. Um, there's a ton of insect diversity, things you would, I, I mean, I have been talking to people and showing them all the pictures of different kinds of bees I've seen. Um, and I'm not the biggest entomologist, so I don't know what all of them are, uh, but you can tell they're different because there's bees that are this right, big and there's right. bees that are just the tiniest things you can ever imagine. Right. Um, butterfly diversity, tortoise beetle diversity, beetles in general diversity. And you just see things that blow your mind. Like one time I was over here and I saw a blue steel cricket killer wasp dragging a cricket through the garden. It would wow. like, like pull it on its antennas and it's it brutal. I mean, it's absolutely brutal to watch, but it's also like nature, that's that's amazing. Um, and you know, it's, I guess, I don't really care about crickets, but it's taking care of uh, pests. And a lot of times you'll see like a, a caterpillar just eviscerated on a leaf because something came through and ate it. So if you're willing to have some more chaos in your garden, you can get a lot more rich and resilient systems uh, that manage themselves to some extent. Right. Not infinitely. It's not no, like, no, I don't want to but... say that I don't have some pests, like squash borer in previous years has been a problem. Um, this year it looks like it's actually growing pretty well. But if we look at the base of it, well, yeah, this one doesn't actually have any evidence of squash borer. But in previous years I have had squash borer that burrows inside of the cucurbit species. Oh. The different. Plants, squash but you can see, with, you know, it's pretty neglected. I right. spilled some biochar juice on it. I mean, like, there's still like, <laughs> it's still like, it's still like, completely. Um, you know, there's basil underneath here. It looked better, obviously, before the derecho came in and knocked it over. Right. Um, but, you know, I've got a ton of tomatoes from it already. And these are tomato plants that I've grown from seed for a couple of years, which is cool. Um, and, you know, the kale's going crazy. I mean, like, even here, you can see there's plenty of insect damage. So these are the Japanese beetles coming in. If I owned this land, I'd probably have chickens here. Because uh, in previous years, I made a chicken lure trap. Mm. And, or a, a Japanese beetle trap in the chicken yard, mm -hmm. and they're attracted, and then the chickens go and eat them. So it's oh, kind of a win-win. That's that's yeah. really cool. But community garden's not the best place to have chickens, probably. That's true. Yeah. But you see, even with this much damage, there's fresh leaves that look great. I mean, that's as right. good as anything you see right. in the store. Um, and I've, you know, pulled out some stuff. So here there was some things growing. Now there's more walking onions that I planted. There's some volunteer tomato plants coming up. Next year, I'm sure there'll be cilantro, or, uh, yeah, cilantro, because I've just throwing these seeds right on the ground. Right. Um, I forget what was here, but it was something that I already harvested. You know, and if something there's too much light, then I'll just go ahead and take a leaf off and you know put it back on the soil. This is about the most exposed soil that you'll see in my garden. Ideally, there'd be none. <laughs> like I'd cover it in wood chips or something, but you know it's it's probably doing fine. So yeah, I mean this is a. You guys should come back later in the fall as I tidy things up, and also next spring when everything's probably the most sensible. Mm -hmm. uh, Everything's in place um, and starting to grow and get lush. You'll see this garden become green and with leaves and flowers probably about a month before the people that till and then plant their stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm harvesting at the point where they're just putting their seeds in. Not everything, but greens are coming out of the garden before mm. any greens you can plant from seed. Yeah. Oh yeah, so here's a, here's a grasshopper too. Mm. It's kind of fun. I'm not sure what kind, but... It's huge. Um, 